There is so many things I could say. After yesterday, it's kind of hard not to just continue. <laughs> but we need to not be reminiscing. We need to be digging. Mm. And although Susan's mother was a woman of God, she would not be pleased with me if I sat up here and talked about her. So we're going to turn to the 139th Psalm. I know, Pastor, you were on Psalm 3 last week. That's a big jump. I did that because it is Sanctity of Human Life Month. And this past Wednesday was the anniversary of the Supreme Court decision, Roe versus Wade. And we pray that soon that decision will be overturned. Millions have lost their lives. There are notes, uh, sheets on the back table if you would like them. Tom has them. Um, I did get that done this week. We chose this passage because of what we read in the 9 o'clock service, and I wanted to mention something about next week. Next week is the first Sunday of February, and there will be a uh, communion service during the nine o'clock service in March. It will be in the 1045 service. And that's how we're going to work it. Uh, while for a while <laughs> we'll alternate back and forth. And then at noon next week, we will have a carry in uh, potluck potluck uh, lunch together. <laughs> Pot Providence. Well, yeah, that's true, but it's in the Providence of God, but, that luck actually is in scripture too. So we'll, we'll, we'll not get theological on that. But I read earlier the verses 13 through 18, where David in this, in this psalm talks about God being the one that created him in his mother's womb. I out the argument for you of why we believe in the sanctity of human life from the moment of conception until the moment of natural death. We believe that we are created in the image of God. And that the moment that new, unique individual is created in the womb of its mother, his or her mother, the moment that new DNA sequence that is unique to only that person and all the billions and billions and billions of people that have ever lived, no one has DNA like yours unless you have a twin. And even then, I'm understanding there may be some subtle differences. It was you who created my inward parts. David says of the Lord. So I want to put this in context. I want to bring you to the entire Psalm, 24 verses. It's a little more than sometimes I cover. We're going to get through the whole thing. And I want you to notice two things. Number one, in verse one, he says, you have searched me and known me. Past tense. And then in Verse 23 and 24, he repeats that at the end of the psalm in the present tense. Search me as if saying, search me now and know me, know my heart now. Test me and see if there is any offensive way in me. We call these bookends in in theology. When you look at a passage of Scripture and you find a statement at the beginning and a statement that is at the end that is the same, it means that everything in the middle is related. It's the author's way of saying that all of this that he's about to say is why he is saying or about him saying, search me and try me. Test me. I don't know how many of you at your jobs would actually go to your boss and say, you know, I, I want you to come in and I want you to, to 
go through everything and I want you to watch and make sure I'm doing everything right and make sure that I'm... That's kind of scary, isn't it? And yet David says of the almighty, all-knowing God, search me. You, you have searched me. You have looked at my heart. You have known everything about me. God knows how many hairs are on your head. He knows how many hairs used to be on my head and how many's left. <laughs> Those of you that saw my brother yesterday know that I got the better head of hair. God doesn't have to work as hard with Todd. He knows everything about you. There is nothing we can hide from God. It says that it said that you can spend a lifetime married to a a spouse and never stop learning about them. I think Dave and Shirley spent 63 I know they spent 63 years together and I don't think she ever understood him. <laughs> And probably vice versa. <laughs> Search me. David says, you've known me. And then he goes on to elaborate in these first few verses about that. You, you know me. You know when I sit down and when I stand up. David says, you, you even know when I'm Stopping to eat, that's what they sat down for. Uh, there wasn't couches in the houses of people in those days. Maybe, maybe in the king's mansion. They sat down to eat. They stood up when they were done. It says, you understand my thoughts from far away. I've been trying to understand my wife's thoughts from far away for a long time. I never have gotten it, gotten it done. But God knows them. <laughs> You know what? I'm committed to a lifetime of learning for, of that woman, and I'll never figure it all out. That's, that's just true. God already knows every thought. From far away, there's, there's nothing hidden from him. He goes on and says, you observe my travels and my rest. You're aware of all of my ways. There we are. He, he knows the direction he's going, the path that he's on. He knows when he sleeps, and he says he knows everything. God's omniscience. There is nothing that ever surprises God. There's been a doctrine out there for some time now. Uh, it, it really started about 20 years ago. Uh, that that said that God God doesn't know what's going to happen. He doesn't know if you're going to do, that we really, when we do something, it surprises God as much as it surprises anybody else. Baloney. Can I get an amen to my baloney? <laughs> Nothing has ever surprised God because I want you to understand this, not only is God omniscient, but he's omnipresent in time. This is something that we have come to understand from the word of God and, Answers in Genesis last year with their time lab really drove this home. He is the Alpha and the Omega, again, bookends. It means he is present in time from everything from the beginning of time, which he started, to the end of time, which he will stop, and into eternity. He's already there. I don't get that. Anybody here understand that? Why? Because we're linear. We're, we go one thing at a time. God isn't linear. He created time and therefore, by definition, if you create something, you have to be outside of that something and therefore he is omnipresent in time. Wow. Nothing surprises God. He's already there. Nothing surprised God last Sunday morning when Shirley went to glory. Nothing surprised God the Wednesday before that when she had the severe stroke. He was not surprised when she walked up to the gates of glory. And he said, well done, good and faithful servant. There was no surprise. God knows all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, I'm still going too fast. Lee, you want to...
needs it when when it needs it because I'm I'm paying attention up here. I'll give it over to my good man in the back. Before a word is on my tongue, you know all about it. Lord, you know the very things I'm going to say. You ever been in the situation and and you, you go into that situation and, and maybe you've thought about what you're going to say, but when you come away, you say, where'd that come from? I have been. I, I've been in situations many times when something, I do get surprised, amen? <laughs> I don't know how, you know, I'm with a family that needs comfort or whatever. I don't know what the right words to say, but I walk away saying, the Lord knew already. The Lord was before me and the Holy Spirit spoke through me. He already knew the words that I was going to say. They, the Lord knows all about it. The Lord is omniscient, omnipresent. You have encircled me. He's all-encompassing. You, you've encircled me and placed your hand on me. We talked last week about Elisha at Dothan. Elisha and his, and his servant were surrounded and certain death, and his servant was all worried. And Elisha prayed that God would open his eyes, and circling the hills was the armies of the living God and the fiery chariots. You know, he doesn't just do that for Elisha. He encircles you and me. He's a shield around me. He, he protects. He defends. Sometimes we... Don't let him do what he's there to do. Sometimes we go our own way anyway. You know what? God's still there with you. Even when we rebel, he's encircled me, David said. Placed your hand upon me. This is the idea of being chosen. David said, You laid your hand on me. David was the, the youngest. Smallest little shepherd boy in the family of Jesse. When Samuel came to anoint the new king, he looked at all the brothers that were big and strong, and boy, those are kingly men. I said, I don't look on the outside. I lay my hand on the one that has the heart, and the Bible says David had a heart after God. God's own, a man after God's own heart. You laid my hand, you've laid your hand on me, you've chosen me. If you know Jesus Christ today, God's chosen you. He not only chose you for salvation, but he's chose you for his work, for what he want, has for you to do. And we all, this is another one of our value statements, we, are, we believe in missional church. Missional church is every one of us is a, is a minister, is, is to be doing the work of, of God. You've been chosen, You're the Lord's hand laid upon you. This extraordinary knowledge is beyond me. It's lofty and I'm unable to reach it. The world wants to bring God down to man. So he's understandable. He wants to to make our sensibilities about who God should be and what He's like fit Him. David has it right. You're beyond me. I can't understand it. We can't begin to, un to comprehend the incomprehensible. It's like trying to comprehend the end of space. Or comprehend how many stars are in the sky. I, I, I love the way Moses wrote about the creation of the stars. He made the sun and the moon. and Oh yeah, he made the stars too. It's uncomprehensible. He's inescapable. He says, where can I go to escape your spirit? 
David wasn't saying, I want to get away from God. His statement is that God is everywhere. Where is there any place in the entire universe that I could be physically present and God not be there? David says, I can't. He, he, he talks first about the spirit world. Where can I flee if I go to heaven? Into the heavens. You know, when man walked on the moon, and yes, even though the conspiracy series it's, theories are out there, man really did walk on the moon. That's my opinion. God was there. But he's talking about the spirit world in the heavens where the, where the angels live. Because he also says, if I make my bed in Sheol, be careful, Sheol does not mean hell. Sheol means the place of the dead. And in David's day, that was Abraham's bosom and hell. If I, if I go into the place where the souls of the dead are, behold, you're there. I can't. I, I, there's no place where you won't be with me. You are never alone. Then he talks about the physical world. If I live at the eastern horizon or settle at the western limits, even there your hand will lead me, your right hand will hold on to me. The physical world. I can go anywhere you lead and you'll be there. I can go anywhere you can think of, and God is there. The deepest, darkest parts of Africa or Papua New Guinea or you name it, even the Philippines. I said that on purpose. God is there. Even in California or Alaska. You name it. From the east to the west, God is there. And God will lead us. In the darkness or the light, God is there. Surely no darkness will hide me from Him. The light around me will be night. Even the darkness is not dark to you. The night shines like day and darkness and light are alike to you. God doesn't need light to see you, to be with you. You can be in the deepest parts of the earth. I've been underground in deep caves and they've shut the lights off and you can't see anything. God can. God's there. They're of no consequence to him because he is the creator of light and darkness. David's setting out the absolute amazingness, I don't know of a better word, of God. And he goes from this adoration of who he is to talking about him as the creator of man. Now, not talking about the creator of Adam and Eve. God cr directly created Adam and from Adam created, by the way, that's what, the only woman that came from man. All the rest of us have come from woman. You all know that, right? Every one of us were, you know, I, I, I'm a man that was once trapped in a woman's body and then she gave birth. Amen? Isn't that great? He's talking about the miracle of procreation. The miracle that's happening inside of Emily right now. As that baby. Grapefruit? Avocado. Big or little? Big avocado. Needing the nourishment and care of its mother. Not ready to survive alone yet but very much a person. The miracle of that is what David describes. He, he says, 
for it was you who created my inward parts. Uh, I, I, forgive me for getting gruesome, but he's talking about the guts and the organs and the various things. It's amazing how early all those things exist in a developing... Amen? Unreal. You, you know, if you took your intestinal tract out, how long it would be? It's unreal. And God sticks it all up inside of you and it all works. It shouldn't work. We shouldn't be able to live. But God. Isn't that great? You you created those things. The, 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 you, you knit me together. My mother-in-law loved to knit. Do you know how easily it is to unravel knitting? Man is like, yeah, I've done it. Accidentally or on purpose. But when knit correctly, it can be incredibly strong. Yeah. There's times when things unravel. But God has knit together those little ones. It's worthy of praise. I will praise you because I have been fearfully or remarkably or amazingly and wonderfully made. The nature of humanity. It amazes me that any doctor could think that what is inside of a woman, a little baby, could be anything but human being. Because a doctor that studies medicine has to be in awe of creation. They can't replicate it. There's some pretty cool robots out there today. I, I've watched some videos on some of these, these newer robots, and they're pretty cool. How many hours and engineers did it take to come up with that? God said, let it be. Are they alive? Nope. We, we went Friday to the funeral home. And we did this for, for my father-in-law and had a viewing. What was in that casket was not alive anymore. It had been for 87 years plus nine months. 87, uh, anyway. 80, over 88 years. It was knit together. And the life was no longer there. Her spirit and soul were gone. There is nothing but awe that should come into our hearts and our minds when we see God's creation of the human being. That is the pinnacle of his creation. David says, I've been amazingly, fearfully, remarkably, wonderfully made. Your works are are wonderful. I know them. personally, he says. This is personal to me. For himself and his children. My bones were not hidden from you when I was made in secret. Inside the womb of a mother, we can't see what's going on. We can see a lot more now with all these fancy machines, but they certainly couldn't. It was all hidden. All they could see was the baby bump, huh, Emily? All they could see was, it's getting bigger because I'm getting bigger. But the bones are being made and developed. And God sees it. And God's in control. What a... Insane tragedy every time a doctor destroys that. I was made in secret. I was formed in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw me when I was formless. Have you ever seen the development? I, there's, there's some videos out there. You ought to watch. 
that take the nine month development of a, of a baby and cram it into about less than a minute. And the first few stages of development, there's, it doesn't look like a baby. But all of a sudden, it pops out and the legs pop out. And, yeah, that's the head. And, oh, those are ears. And, and, but back when it's, there's no form to it yet. David says, your eyes still saw me. All my days were written in your book and planned before a single one of them began. I, this is a profound verse. Be careful. It might change your theology. All my days were written in your book and planned before a single one of them began. I'll tell you, my friends, that does a number on free will. Sorry, not me saying it. The Holy Spirit said it through David. You want to argue with the book? Go ahead. All my days were written down. God in his omniscience and his sovereignty had it all planned out. Well, even these little ones, these millions of little ones that have died since Roe v. Wade, he knew their days. Surely, 87 years old, he knew her days before she was even born in 1932. He knew all of them. That's a lot of days. My father-in-law, Thursday, turned 90. He, knew, he knows the very last day he will live. We don't. Please forgive me if I say we're hoping that he goes to be in glory soon. It's best for him. If you have problems with that, you don't understand glory. You don't understand heaven. I'd like to help you understand that and have the peace that comes with knowing God. How difficult are your thoughts? To comprehend how vast their sum is. You're beyond my understanding, God, David says. Your thoughts are so amazing that, that if one thought was as a grain of the sand of the sea, they, your thoughts would outnumber them. How many of you would like to go to the seashore, just one beach, and start counting grains of sand? And all the beaches of all the, all the oceans and all the lakes of all the world, and God's thoughts at one moment outnumber them all. There's no supercomputer that can compare. How vast, how infinite. You know, sometimes I, I think we forget to be in awe of God. We start to be in awe of man. And we need to get back to being in awe of God. We start to be in, in awe of our thoughts and what we think God's like and all of this. And we need to go back to understanding who He is, what the Word of God that He gave us says about Himself. And we need to go, wow. God is amazing. His grace is amazing. Notice what David says at the end of verse 18. When I wake up, I'm still with you. When I wake up, I'm still with you. Your thoughts, your abiding presence, I'm still with you despite all of it. You hold me near. We don't have to understand God to be with God. If we did, none of us would, would be able to be. We don't have to know all about God to be God's child. I love blowing my children away with some new tidbit that I've known for a long time that I still haven't taught them. Uh, they, they tell me that I am a wealth of useless knowledge, and it's very true. My mother used to go, I, I would spout something off as a teenager because I, I just 
my mind was a little bit of a trap on certain things. There's other things that my mind won't trap for any anything. I just but there's certain facts and crazy figures and things that and my mother would say, How do you know that? And I'd say, I don't know. I read it someplace. I don't think it's true. And then we I find out that it was true. My daughter turned 17 today. If you didn't know that, today's Talitha's birthday. She's just like me. Be careful what you wish for. David goes on to a very difficult section. Let's just skip this. No, let's not. God, your desire is my desire. God, if you would only kill the wicked, what a world we'd live in if all those that are wicked were gone. You know, serving as the chaplain for the police department has opened my eyes for a little bit, a little bit in Tracy. There's there's 98% of Tracy residents are good people as far as the world's concerned. Of course, the Bible says none of us are good. Amen? But law-abiding citizens, at least not breaking laws really bad. And then there's the 2% that you run into every day that are breaking the law just enough to be on the radar. There's the ones that get sent off to jail and they're gone for life and, you know, all of this. But the ones that just, they, they can't help themselves but do bad things because they don't know Jesus Christ. They're wicked. David says, oh, if you would only kill the wicked, the bloodthirsty men and keep them away from me. The people who call on God deceitfully. Boy, we have churches full of those in America today, who invoke God's name, who call on religion to their own benefit. Be wary of people that do that. Your enemies swear by you falsely. And then David says this this verse that just, just doesn't feel comfortable. Do I not hate those, and I'm going to put in people. People want to say those bad things. No, 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 no. That's not what he's saying. The, the men that, that swear by you falsely, the ones that are bloodthirsty, he says he hates them. And we cringe. How could David, under the inspiration of God, say that he hates somebody? You're not supposed to hate people. We should hate what God hates. And I want you to know that hate does not mean have, have bad feelings towards somebody. Although uh, there's, there's wicked people that I have bad feelings towards. If love is doing what is best for the one loved, then hate is judgment on the wicked. To, to hate the wicked is to desire God's just judgment upon them has nothing to do with emotions or or feelings. It has to do with a desire for God to do justice. I sat on two juries in my life. I don't know if I'll ever get this chance again. I sat on two juries. The child molestation case. At the end of the trial, the judge sentenced him to 78 years to life in prison. And I rejoice that this Wicked young man is off the streets. Justice! The second one was an assault with a deadly weapon charge, and he didn't get near as much time. But he's paying a price for his wickedness. And we rejoice in justice. We also desire them to come to repentance. Amen? Our greatest joy would be to see one of these wicked, bloodthirsty men come to Christ and we would shout, Hallelujah! Hallelujah. Praise God. 
Paul was that man. The Apostle Paul brought people to death, held the garments of Stephen, and God took a hold of him on the road to Damascus and said, you're mine. And he got saved. And he became the greatest apostle. To hate is does not mean you can't also desire to love. David says, I've hated them with an extreme hate word, hatred. These are tough words. Yes, they're in the Bible. Maybe we should just rip that page out. Heaven forbid. I consider them my enemies, and we should consider the wicked our enemies. We should desire to make them our friends and consider them our enemies at the same time. And you know how we fight enemies? With love, with prayer, giving a cup of cold water. That's what we do to our enemies. Amen? Search me. After saying that, David says, search me. Know my heart. Is it right? Is these things that I'm saying right before God? Test me. And see if there's any offense in me. David killed Uriah the Hittite, the husband of Bathsheba, and paid a price for it and repented. And yet he was still called God after man's own heart. A man after God's own heart. Did I say a God after man's own heart? Yeah, yeah, that was really wrong. A man after God's own heart. I got to slow down. God's forgiveness is great. David was able to say after that, see if there's any wicked way in me. Nathan, the prophet, stood in front of David and shook his bony finger at David and said, you're the man. And David wept. David's little boy was born and died shortly thereafter. And David wept. And then he got up. When the baby had died, he got up and washed his face. And he went back to living life because there was nothing more he could do. His, his servants didn't understand. Why, why are you not weeping now? And David's like, because there's, I, while there was hope, I wept. While there was hope, I employed God. Now. I wash my face and I go about living for God. David says, see if there's any offensive way in me, God. Test me. Show me. Don't pray this if you don't want God to show you where your offense is and to bring you to your knees in repentance. But if you want to live right before God and you want God to show you your offense, pray this prayer that David's praying. Because God already knows he is the amazing creator God that is with you who encircles you, that knows you. We need to line up, as David was saying, our will with God's will. Do I not hate those that hate you and that you hate? Do I not hate the wicked? We need to line up our will with God's. So often we try to get God to line up his will with ours. Wow, are we out of line. Lead me in the everlasting way. Not my way, but yours. Lead me where you want me to go. Lead me with your word. Show me. This is how God leads, folks. He gave us the book. It's the map. It's the guidebook. It's it's everything we need. Remember, we believe in the supremacy and the sufficiency of Scripture. It is the supreme authority in our life, and it is sufficient for everything we need, for all of life and godliness. You say, yeah, but if so, this happens, I need to go to, this, you know, to the world for this or that. No, the answer's in the book. The answers are in the book, and if we go turn away from the book, we're not letting God lead us in the everlasting way. David desired God to lead. 
I think David desired God to use him too. To use him as his instrument for his glory. And I hope you do as well. I hope that's what you take away this morning. That we desire for God to show us where we're wrong and to lead us in what's right. Very simple. You know, this really boils down to those two things. Because of who he is. David spent the whole 139th Psalm talking about who he is just so we can understand that it's God who should show us what's wrong should lead us in what's right. And he does that through his word. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you show us when we ask. Please be open to see. May we not be blinded. May our understanding be full. May we not turn a blind eye to our own sin. And Father, lead us. Guide us through your word. Be our shepherd. Even as David said, the Lord is my shepherd. We desire that as well. In our personal lives and as a church. In Jesus' name, amen.